I'm very pleased to introduce the very first evening keynote lecturer of the second week of Web 2019. This week, we'll focus on the relationship between time and humanities, featuring themes on visualization time, time and Formula One, time and society, and time and history. Richard Sussman is a Guggenheim New York Foundation for the Arts and McDowell Colony Fellow. Her decade-long project, The Oldest Living Things in the World, combines art, science, and philosophy into a worldwide traveling exhibition and New York Times best-selling book, which we have copies of in campus after her keynote. In 2014, she began developing new installation work, deepening her exploration of personal and cosmic time, the universe, nature, philosophy, and beauty. With the support of the, of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art Lab and working with SpaceX, NASA, and CERN, and her new work can be found, found at Mass MoCA, the New Museum Los Gatos, and the Taipei Art Museum. She is currently an artist in residence with the SETI Institute. Her exhibition record spans more than a decade in museums and galleries in the US, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Please welcome to Chaos, Rachel Sussman. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So back in 2004, I took a trip to Japan. And I had just finished an artist residency in New York City, where I live, and I just bought a new camera, medium format film camera. I still shoot with film and digital. Um, and I was in a place where I was ready to explore. I was looking for something big to connect with in my artwork. And I find that that, for me, happens best when I'm in a new place. And so I was invited to Tokyo by some friends, and I rarely pass up an invitation. And so I went with my new camera, and I had been making a lot of photographs, landscape photographs, that really were about the relationship between nature and humanity. And I went with my sense of curiosity, but I didn't know specifically where I was going to go. So after I spent a week in Tokyo with friends, I went to Kyoto, and I was on my own. And I realized that I didn't actually speak the language very well. Um, and Japanese is, is pretty difficult to speak. Uh, so I was in Kyoto, and I was wondering, what am I doing here? I started to get really uncomfortable. I started to feel like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. And I had to give myself permission to turn around and go home. And this is very unlike me. I you know, go out for an adventure, see it all the way through. But I had to have this moment of saying, you know what, it's OK. And then I remembered one of the few Japanese phrases that I do know. Fundoshi o shimete. It means tighten your loincloth. <laughs> so this really is like your grandfather telling you to buck up. It's an old-fashioned kind of phrase. So I gave myself permission to go home, and then I immediately packed up and turned around and went the absolute opposite direction. A few people I'd been speaking to had told me that there was a 7,000-year-old tree living on a remote island called Yakushima. And to me, this really sparked my curiosity. They said, you're interested in nature and the relationship between humanity and nature. You have to go visit this tree. This is that tree. So not only did I decide to go on this adventure, but what happened was one of the most remarkable and transformative experiences I've ever had. So I'd taken that discomfort of not speaking the language, of feeling alienated. And instead, I took a train to the southernmost point of Kyushu, and I got on a ferry, the four, three or four hour ferry ride. And once I would land on the island of Yakushima, it was a two day hike. So it was a very big commitment to visit this tree. And when I boarded the ferry, I made some new friends. It was a couple. Um, he was Canadian, she was Japanese, and they were visiting some friends on the island. And they took one look at my rolling suitcase and they said, what are you doing? And they said, I don't, you don't look, we know you're not one of the English teachers and you don't look like you're about to go hiking. But I told them what I wanted to do. And it turned out 
that the gentleman was the person who had done the English translation for the plaque in front of this tree. So they knew exactly where it was. And by the time I'd landed on the other side, I'd been invited to stay with them in the home of the people that they were going to visit. And we hiked together and had the most remarkable experience. And the whole island um, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Incredibly beautiful, lush, wonderful experience with the, and the physicality of hiking through very uh, difficult terrain and through the rain was deeply moving to me. And so I got to this tree and I made photographs and we continued on our way. So it wasn't at that moment that the light bulb went on and I got the idea. I was still percolating, I was still gathering the pieces. And it wasn't until over a year later, I was back home in New York City, and I got the idea for the project, The Oldest Living Things in the World. It suddenly coalesced and came together for me, all the disparate pieces that I'd been searching for that I was interested in. It would be an art project, and making photographs of nature. And it would be about science. It was very important to me that I look and that I seek out accurate scientific information from the actual researchers who did the field work to discover these organisms. And it would be about philosophy, about philosophical thinking about the nature of time and our relationship to it. So this is a map of all of my subjects. So there's a few here that I didn't get to, but most of them I did. So I, I, I photographed 30 different representative species that have been individually alive for 2,000 years or longer. And so why did I choose 2,000 years? Well, I wanted to draw attention to the shallowness of human timekeeping. Why is it 2019 right now? Isn't it 4 billion, 500 million 2019? So I was just starting to play with this idea of what if we change our relationship to time? And we're not looking at five minutes ago, five minutes from now, this very narrow uh, time, like I haven't looked at my phone in a few seconds. Uh-oh. Well, let's start to consider the lifespans of these remarkable organisms. And so I set out. I set out on this journey, and I had, <laughs> I had to figure out even where to start. So it wasn't like there was a list of all the oldest organisms, because this project hadn't been done before. So in fact, I thought I was going to find an evolutionary biologist who would partner with me and we would co-author the book and this project. By the way, I didn't even know it was a book when it started. I just knew it was an art project. So I met with some evolutionary biologists and they said, we're not qualified to do this. I said, well, what are you talking about? It's like, well, you're talking about fungus and bacteria and plants and animals. I do one thing of one subset of this one species. That's what I do. I was like, oh, okay. It's like, he's like, you're going to have to be the expert. So I said, okay. So instead of working with one scientist, I worked with 30. I got to seek out everybody who was doing the research on these individual organisms. And I also had to face my own personal challenges, like learning to scuba dive. I actually had a fear of deep water. And so that was going to stand in the way if I wanted to photograph this 100,000-year-old seagrass meadow that lives in the Balearic Islands in Spain. I got to go on all sorts of adventures that I'm so grateful that I got to experience. And then, but yet each one of them was a challenge for me personally. It's a challenge to raise the money to be able to go. It was a challenge to face fears, like this uh, baobab tree that's around 2,000 years old in the Kruger Game Preserve in South Africa. Oh, I needed to have an armed escort to visit the site, just in case some lions might be interested in us when I was going to photograph. Um, this is a brain coral in Tobago, another, another organism I got to uh, photograph underwater. Corals are actually animals. I was really surprised to learn that there are animals that are over 2,000 years old. So one of the things that I discovered was the absolute, my capacity to learn was so expanded when there was an idea that really mattered to me. I was so excited to learn about each of these things and to share the information that I was gathering. And to spare you the suspense, the oldest known living thing in the world is a bacterial colony living in Siberia in the permafrost. 
It's called Siberian actinobacteria, and it's between 400,000 and 600,000 years old. And what's particularly interesting about this is that it's doing DNA repair below freezing. So it hasn't been dormant and just locked away in ice. It's actually been slowly living and growing for half a million years. So this image is a landscape that I made in Greenland. So I shared with you that um, before I was starting the Oldest Living Things project, I was making a lot of landscape work about the relationship between humanity and nature. And to me, a lot of these were emotional and, and philosophical and psychological landscapes. And to me, this is no different. So this image is also in my book. And it's right near this photograph of some 3,000-year-old uh, lichens. So for me, you know, if you, just saw, if you just saw a picture of the lichens, you might not get a sense of the grandeur and vastness of this landscape. So for me, visiting a place like this is actually like traveling back in time. Uh, so I had an experience in Greenland of getting lost alone for a little while. It was one of the biggest teaching moments I had uh, in, in the entire 10 years of working on the project. And I was lost for about eight hours, and then I came back in pocket after that. But it was it truly, uh, woke me up to paying attention to responsibility, responsibility for oneself, what it means to be in a landscape such as this. I also got to experience a glacial stream teeming with hundreds and hundreds of trout. There were so many of them that you could just grab a fish directly out of the water. And to me, this was another moment that was like time travel. This must have been the abundance that covered the planet before people covered the planet. So I can almost see how we were misguided in using up our resources. And yet there's this little reminder, OK, this is how it used to be, and a reminder to care for what we currently have. I'll get back to these lichens a bit later, but these are one of my favorite organisms in the project because they grow one centimeter every 100 years. And to me, that number is such a great way to start to connect. How else are you going to connect with a lichen? How else are you going to feel what it's like to live on a rock in that landscape? Well, what if you spent the entirety of your being growing one centimeter? Continents are drifting away faster than these lichens are growing. I'm back on the other side, back down in Africa. Other side of the planet, the Wellwichia plant. This is, this is one of my favorites. Um, so this one is around 2,000 years old. And again, fascinating plant. Um, you have, um, I fortunately don't have a laser pointer, but if you can see a little bit in the center there, there's actually a trunk. And what looks like two piles of leaves are actually a single leaf on each side. And so these have the longest leaves of the plant kingdom. They just pile on top of each other and grow and grow and grow. It's a primitive conifer. Um, the local people in Namibia will tell their children, if you're bad, the Wellwichia is going to come and get you. So watch out. Um, and this strange plant is called the Uretta. So this is sort of the poster child of the project. It's so bizarre looking. It is not moss over rocks. It's actually a shrub made up of thousands of branches. And at the end of each branch is a cluster of little leaves. Um, so this is in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile. And I'll take you to Tasmania. So one of the things that I learned about through the course of this work was about clonal organisms. So we understand unitary organisms like a single tree. Humans were unitary organisms. We're not dividing and cloning that we know of yet. Um, some organisms are actually self-propagating. So this plant, the Lomatia tasmanica, Tasmanian Lomatia, has been living and growing in southwest Tasmania for at least 43,600 years. And it's the only one left of its species. So it's both critically endangered and it's theoretically immortal because it keeps sending up new shoots and regenerating itself. So I love the dichotomy of that. It's, uh, and it is so fragile, by the way. So this was photographed in the Botanic Garden in Hobart. And they have a number of different um, clippings that they have propagated 
um, in their research greenhouse. And so they took one of the larger ones that was flowering. They were having a botanical conference, and they just took it to the building next door. Several hours later, by the time the conference was, uh, was, was in swing, it had died. That's how sensitive it is. And yet, this plant is 43,600 years old. I imagine some of you are familiar with the stromatolites. They've been a hot topic this week, as far as, as, far as the geological time goes. Um, and stromatolites are so fascinating. They're part biologic and part geologic. They're made of bound cyanobacteria. So that cyanobacteria is, is performing photosynthesis. So the, the number fluctuates from exactly where we can pinpoint the, the first uh, stromatolites known on Earth, but it's around 3.5 billion years ago. And they did the job of oxygenating the planet. It took 900 million years. Um, one of the things that I loved about visiting the stromatolites, these are in Western Australia. So this colony is between two and 3,000 years old, and it's the oldest living, uh, continually living colony. We have many fossilized stromatolites all over the world. Um, but just over the ridge of the beach there is a meteor impact site. So this is exciting because it starts to get the mind wondering about the possibilities of life on Earth having originated elsewhere in the solar system or beyond. Now, this photograph, I'm going to take it back into slightly more shallow time, into a more geologic time. Um, back here on Earth is, uh, this image is on the cover of my book. And the reason it's on the cover is that I think of it as a photograph uh, excuse me. <clears throat> I, think of, I think of this photograph as a portrait of climate change. Now, why is that? Well, so you probably would not guess that this uh, gnarly little tree is 9,550 years old. Well, for the first 9,500 of year, 9,500 years of its life, it was just that scrubby mass of branches that's right at the base of of the uh, ground line. And then the past 50 or 60 years or so, the spindly stalk, shot trunk, shot up in the center of it. So this is living on a mountaintop plateau in Sweden, and it's not the only tree behaving like this. So scientists started to notice the, this phenomenon, started doing some research, and realized that the climate zone had changed on this remote plateau. And so the strategy of this, of this organism has changed. So the strategy that's been working for nearly 10,000 years to send up a branch here, a branch there, get completely covered in snow, regenerate, it's now changed the strategy because of the warmth on the top of, of this plateau. So we don't know what the long-term effect, long effects will be for this particular organism, but it's a great example how this isn't, the middle, isn't in the middle of a bustling city. This doesn't have a ton of traffic around it. And yet we can see directly how human action is affecting every single organism on this planet. Likewise, the bristlecone pine. So the bristlecone pine, these ones uh, live in California in the US. And these are the oldest unitary organisms on the planet, so a single organism. And the oldest are over 5,000 years old. And they're quite gnarled. Um, they're rather small in comparison. So one of the things I started to realize, I started to just look at what are the characteristics of the oldest living organisms? Well, they tend to live in very extreme environments at high altitudes or low moisture, low nutrient availability. And they're uniquely adapted to these places. So places where other organisms couldn't survive, they're thriving. And the question is, will that continue? So where the bristlecone pines live, again, climate zone is changing. It's getting warmer. What does that mean for them? Well, it means 
some invasive beetles have been able to get, get in, invasive fungus. Um, if you're interested in the bristlecone pine, there's, I recommend Googling. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, story on NPR that talks about the researcher who first discovered their age. And it's a rather, it has a little bit of a tragi tragic uh, twist to it, but out of it came all the knowledge that we have about the bristlecone. So we have the effects of climate change happening, but we also have the more direct impact of people interacting with these organisms on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so this tree was living in Florida, um, just outside of Orlando, and it was 3,500 years old. Um, it passed away in, in 2012, and this was probably one of the most poignant and important um, visits that I made over the course of the 10 years of my project. And the reason is, I had photographed this tree in 2007, and I had just returned home from these amazing adventures. I'd been in Africa and all over Europe, and, and then I got home to the US, and I was just going, just going to Florida. So for me, that was an easy trip in Orlando. It's full of tourists. It's like, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. And I made some photographs, and then I wasn't very happy with them. And I thought, I can go back any time. It's easy. This tree is 3,500 years old. It's not going anywhere. And so in 2012, I was about to leave for Antarctica, and somebody sent me this news bulletin that this tree, the senator tree, had been on fire for over a week. And it had been on fire for a week before anyone noticed. And the reason was it had been set on fire from the inside out. So some kids had snuck into the tree. It was a protected, protected by a fence. You can see there's a, a bit of the remains of the fence protected by a um, gates of a park, some kids had snuck in and decided to do drugs inside the tree, which was hollow. And then they posted about it on Facebook. They posted that they dropped, one of them had dropped their lighter and caught the tree on fire from the inside out. And it acted as its own chimney. It burned for that week. And so there was nothing to do but to put the fire out and say goodbye to the tree. But for me, why it was so important to be there was that I, it, the impact was the realization that I understood that just because something has longevity does not mean that it's permanent. Every moment matters. Every action that we take matters. And so to be able to revisit this tree and make this photograph and share the story was very important to me. And there's a little bit of a happy ending, I mean, a small one. Um, because the, of the great age of this tree, there had been some samples taken, and they were growing in, um, in a research nursery. And so they transferred one of the clones back to this site. And then they asked the people of the community to decide on a name for it, and they named it the Phoenix. So after that experience, I went to Antarctica. It took me two years to arrange my passage there. Um, I was absolutely thrilled to learn that there was an old organism on Antarctica. Because to me, this project is about organisms that belong to all of us, that are about the history, legacy, birthright of all of us. And to have them living on every continent was so poignant. So what's living on Antarctica? 5,500-year-old moss. It's a little bit difficult to see, but if you can see some green on that downward slope, that's it. That's the moss bank. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Ernest Shackleton. Uh, so Shackleton was uh, an explorer. It's about 100 years ago in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration where everyone wanted to be the first, to, the first to make land, the first to get to the South Pole, the first to cross the continent. So there are all sorts of adventures happening. It was incredibly, incredibly dangerous. So Shackleton and his crew made it all the way to the Weddell Sea, down to Antarctica. And then the ice came in sooner in the season than, he, than they expected, and their ship was trapped. They were trapped, and they had not yet made land. So Shackleton and his crew had to abandon ship. The ship was eventually crushed. And at some point, they made their way to Elephant Island. This is Elephant Island. 
they were marooned right around the corner from this mosque that I was seeking. And so this was this beautiful poetic moment where I could start to weave together the stories of humanity with the stories of these organisms. I thought to myself, if Shackleton knew about this moss, well, for one thing, if he knew, they probably would have gone and eaten it because they were starving. Um, but if he had known, I really feel like he would have had the same respect that I do for this organism, for all of these organisms. Um, being in Antarctica was a profound experience for me. Um, I started getting into this place of, OK, well, once you go to Antarctica, what's next? Space, but not so fast. I also wanted to truly connect with what it is to be in this place in the world. And one of the things that struck me over time, so I'm talking and thinking about time all the time, deep time, long-term thinking. How do we get out of the narrow and into the expansiveness? So here I am in some of the worst seas in the world, and I was thinking about how deep time is really like deep water. So we're constantly pulled back to the surface, to the wants and needs of the moment. I'm hungry, I'm tired, I wanna go, I wanna go do this, I wanna go do that. But the more we train ourselves to stay in the depths, the more comfortable we get. And when we're more comfortable, we can get curious, we can start to look around, we can start to explore. And when we start to explore, we can start to connect with wonder. So this is um, Shackleton's grave. This is on South Georgia Island. Um, if you don't know Shackleton's story, I highly, highly recommend um, uh, reading the book. I believe it's just called Endurance, which is the name of his ship. Um, profoundly moving story. Um, so this is his grave. This is a giant elephant seal hanging out, guarding him. And so for me, this was a moment of closure, of, of finishing this decade-long project. And of course, I came back home and edited and made my book. But this was reaching a final goal in, in traversing all the continents of the world, looking for these organisms in order to share them with you. Um, so this is me uh, photographing a 13,000-year-old shrub in California. And so, you know, I was just talking about deep time, but there's another aspect of time that I really find fascinating, which is this idea of temporal layering, when we have multiple time scales happening in the same moment. So think about taking a photograph. There's a click of the shutter, 60th, 125th of a second. And then we have these two extremes. We have, we have the organisms, in this case, that are tens or hundreds of thousands of years old. And then you have you and me. They're making or observing the photograph. And yet they all come together to share this moment. So after spending all these years doing this project, I was a little worn out. And I was at home in my studio working on my book. And this came across my desk, Kintsukuroi. So it's funny, I just have this little return to Japan. So in uh, Japanese aesthetic philosophy, the idea of kintsukuroi, which means golden repair, to repair with gold. The idea is something is made more beautiful for having been broken. This truly resonated with me, thinking about the lives of these organisms, and my own life too, all of the energy and effort and resources that I expended making this project. And so it wasn't right away, but over time, what I started to do was, I'd been making some photographs of, uh, of interesting cracks. So just sort of connecting with the idea of geologic time in a, in a small scale, in a personal way. And so I put it together. Wouldn't it be interesting to take the art of kintsukuroi, which is traditionally just done on pottery, so it's something that's very precious, it's put on a shelf, and to actually take it literally out into the streets into something that's totally not precious. So I was making photographs like this, and then I started doing this. I started painting them. So, so, the, so the first images I'm going to show you here are photographs, 8 and a half by 11 small photographs that are painted with enamel paint and uh, gold dust, or sometimes they're a mix of gold and bronze. Um, and then I also do installations directly in the ground, which I'll show you a few of those 
as well. So I began doing these wherever I was, in New York, in California, in China. And then I got to actually do these installations in the ground. So this was the very first one that I did. So this is a mix of resin with gold dust. Um, and this was in, in California. And a close-up here. This is at the Matsmoka Museum in Western Massachusetts. And so work like this, you might say, well, this is really different from your other work. And in some ways, yes, it is. But it's also about time. It's about connecting personal time to the elemental forces that are around us all the time. So you can see this is covered with snow. How long is this going to last? I'm not sure. So I talked to a museum, make this installation. They said, what's the warranty? How long is it going to be here? I said, I don't know. And that's part of the artwork. So we look at cracks in the ground and the sidewalk and say, oh, OK. It's, you can sort of connect with the idea of geologic time in that way. You can see how the shape of a crack in the pavement might look similar to the crack in a giant canyon in the earth. And in these cases, I'm saying, what if we repair the cracks? What if we make the healing visible? So taking it a step further to make it personal, take something that's very hard and detached and create a personal relationship with it. Um, so I actually just finished a new installation um, earlier this week. So this is in uh, Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. And I wanted to show you this tool. It's called a chalk purr. So pay attention to that, and I will show you uh, the relationship uh, with that in another project that I did. By the way, this involves a lot of crawling around on the floor. So... For whatever reason, most of the work I do is not physically easy on my body. And that's OK. I'm OK with that. But I'm open to, to gentler ideas. Um, so I want to jump back for a moment to these lichens I told you about in Greenland, the 3,000-year-old lichens. So these are the Rhizocarpin geographicum, our map lichens. Well, some of these map lichens were taken into outer space by astrobiologists and exposed to outer space conditions for 10 days with no protection, just in open space. And they returned completely healthy and intact. So I learned this uh, towards the end of my project. And then you remember the stromatolites. So there's the possibility, I'm not saying we know this, but there's the possibility that that cyanobacteria or some other primitive life form piggybacked into our atmosphere on a meteorite. So we've been talking about this personal geologic time. And so as I was wrapping up the project, I was oldest living things, starting to do the consuperoy work, I realized that it was time to venture out into space. So there are those tools that I showed you that I was using uh, to place the gold. They're called uh, chalk purrs. What's a chalk bar? It's used to make sand mandalas. So I was sitting out in front of Mass Mocha doing this massive installation of the Kintsukuroi when I suddenly got the idea to combine the art of making sand mandalas with something that was fascinating me at the moment, the cosmic microwave background. So I thought, wasn't, wouldn't it be interesting to combine something that's incredibly high tech with something that's incredibly low tech. But both are about the nature of humanity, what it means to be here, what we're doing here, who we are, trying to make sense of it. And so I decided to make a sand mandala of the cosmic microwave background. So um, I assume most people are familiar with the cosmic microwave background. If not, it's also known as the baby picture of the universe. So it's, uh, it's radiation imprinted on the sky 280,000 years after the Big Bang. And so this red that you see through the center of this image, usually that's cleaned up and taken out when you would see this image. Um, the reason I chose this one is because that red represents the heat of us, of humanity, the, or the interference, if you will. So this is one of those instances where the concept resonated with what I was trying to convey, and also visually, 
it brought some interest to the image. So over the course of, I believe it was 10 days, I'm not entirely sure, I just mapped out square foot by square foot each piece of the cosmic microwave mandala and created it. So this is the finished piece. This was uh, exhibited at the um, um, New Museum Los Gatos in Northern California as part of the SETI Artists in Residence program. So SETI is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, so this was my contribution. And so we've talked about longevity in art and these pieces and these organisms. Well, sand mandalas are meant to be impermanent. They're meant to be destroyed after a period of being viewed. And so this was up for a number of months. And then I created a ceremony around destroying it. And so I swirled all of that information about the early universe back into a pile. And then I shared jars of sand with everybody who came to visit to share and continue to spread the ideas that came out from there. And I've also been doing a project called Selected History of the Space-Time Continuum. So how do we get deeper and deeper into space and into time? Where do space and time start to become the same thing? I really wanted to push those boundaries. So the selected history of the space-time continuum is a site-specific installation. This is the first one, the first installation. It starts before the Big Bang in a swirl of competing theories. And it goes 10 to the 101 billion years into the future. Because, you know, why stop now? Why stop 10 billion years from now? I actually spoke with a physicist who told me about this theory, the five ages of the universe, to help describe the time and space and the theories that we have currently about the nature of the universe. So right now we're in the stelliferous era, full of stars. In a duodecillion years from now, all the stars will have gone out. So what I'm trying to do as I continue my practice is continue to make these relationships with things that would otherwise be too abstract for us. So as humans, our brains aren't meant to synthesize these vast amounts of time. We're not physiologically equipped for it. And yet the idea here is to make a personal connection. So it's sort of like if you look out at the horizon, you look out at the ocean, and there's nothing there's nothing on the sea, you have no way to gauge distance. The same is true for time. It becomes so abstract that we don't have an opportunity to make a personal connection. So my goal with my art is to make a little connection where you can use that as a waypoint to connect, to make sense of, to personalize the experience of time. And why is that important? Because Deep, thinking about deep time leads to long-term thinking. And long-term thinking is absolutely required now more than ever on our planet. And if I can help do that through art, all the better. It doesn't have to be painful. It can be joyous. Um, I currently have this uh, iteration of the timeline installed at the Taipei Biennial in uh, Taiwan and had to snap a couple of pictures of, of, of these uh, young women enjoying the black hole era and the dark era, taking a selfie in the dark era. It was great. Starting to make connections with these times and spaces. So I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Dear Mighty Face. So I believe we're going to do some Q&A. So if anybody has some questions, I think some microphones are going to be going around. Uh, yes, right here. Can you, uh, I think, uh, is there a microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, how, do, how, how do you define the age of the species, like the tree? How do you decide that it is 20 years old? Or 
Yes, very good question. So I actually, when I was doing my research, I always tried to use the published scientific papers for each of the organisms. It was very important to me that the science be accurate. So in most cases, these organisms have been studied, and sometimes they weren't. So there's this popular folklore about it with fairly good evidence about their age. Um, but most of the organisms that I photographed have published scientific research to back up the assertions. Yes. Thank you for a touching, beautiful uh, presentation. You. So you are weaving in and out of human civilization, going to wild places, and then going back to our civilization, mm -hmm. which is subsuming more and more of the planet. Can you tell us how did it work out for you to get out, commune with nature, and then be back mm. among the chimneys and cars and yes. brush and everything else? Yeah. How that's... painful is it in the end? <laughs> it's a good question. And I have to say, it's pretty painful. It is painful. But that being said, I love connecting with other humans. I love being able to share what I find. Um, I live in New York City. It's pretty overwhelming in terms of just scale and scope and people. And I do find that personally, I'm always wanting to be back in nature as much as I can. And I feel incredibly fortunate that I've been able to visit the places that I have. And I feel that it's part my duty to be able to share the messages that I receive, as opposed to saying, hey, everybody go out to these remote places, because that will defeat the purpose of, my, of the work that I've done. So my hope is that through the work, through the book, if you ever get to see the photographs in person, I make very giant prints, and to create some kind of relationship with the nature through the expression of the project, and actually seeing the organisms together, because it really is, um, while each individually is really impressive, it's really about thinking about them collectively, where the impact comes in. So I hope that I, hope that I can do that justice. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, one of the picture uh, you said um, a line that every moment matters. Yes. Um, I want to know uh, how do you come up with this line and uh, what happens uh, in your life or work after that? Thanks. <laughs> well, where does anybody get their ideas? I mean, for me, by immersing myself in the concepts and the the, the physical places, but just the aesthetic, personal, psychological, um, scientific ideas, it helps to generate the ideas that I hope will, will percolate out of me. So mostly what I suggest to people is show up, follow your interests. So I spent, I, I didn't really go into it, but I spent years searching without knowing what I was searching for. So I shared the story of, of coming up with the oldest living things. But even standing in front of the tree, it wasn't like, oh, got it. It takes time. These things need to be nurtured. And so I recommend to everybody nurturing your creativity, no matter what field you're in, whether it's science and technology or something that's considered a traditional creative art. The important thing is to, to show up and do whatever practice you need to do every day. Um, hello. Over here, in the ah. dark. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Irene Hettiger, um, and uh, thank you very much for this presentation and this very personal journey as well that you were explaining. I have a question because you've been working with scientists that are probably monitoring these kind of sites, the organisms, and researching about that. And I guess they are also producing visual material. So my question is, um, like, one way of doing something like that could also be like to kind of collect the images of the scientists and do a book with it. And you've done your own images. So can you tell me something about this relationship and how maybe your images uh, are different? Or what's the importance? Well, sure. I mean, my yeah. background is as an artist. I went to art school. I studied photography. When I make um, exhibitions, it's a little bit difficult to tell when you're just looking at a PowerPoint slide. But when you see, when you're in a room full of photographs made on film, 
printed on fine art paper, the feeling is quite different from a digital snapshot taken by the scientists. So often the scientists were asking me if they could use my work in their papers, which I always allowed them to. Um, but I was creating a conceptual art project, but also it was important to me that I make the photographs. And that was my relationship to this particular work. And it's perfectly valid to make other kinds of projects where I wouldn't have to be the author of the images. I mean, I also did the writing. It was important to me that, so in my book, of the images, I also wrote an essay about each of my 30 subjects. And the style that I wrote in combines all the science that I learned, but also it says things about my personal experience, as well as things happening in my personal life. And the reason I chose to do that was I wanted to show how we can synthesize all these things, the things that are interesting to us, into forms that don't, didn't previously exist. And to show that we really are transdisciplinary. I'm not just this, and the science, I'm not just an artist, and a scientist isn't just a scientist. I can't tell you how many times they would say, well, this is what it says in the paper, but this is what really happened. Did you also have discussions with the scientists about the visual language you're choosing and you know, that they are. Mm. That, did you have conversations with the scientists about A that? little bit. It depended on the person. So if you were interested in that, and others weren't. And, okay. But I would say nine, kind of, nine times out of 10, the scientists were thrilled that somebody was interested in their work, because some of it is quite esoteric. And so to have somebody who was coming from outside their field and drawing attention to what might be their life's work was something that they were very happy about, as was I. So it was really mutually beneficial. Thank you for the talk. It was uh, utterly fascinating. Thank you. So uh, this is a very one-of-a-kind approach and interface I've seen between science and art. Uh, what actually led to this sort of approach? Because I've never seen uh, this, you know, such a homogenous mixture of physics, mm. biology, art, and it's just uh, unbelievably smooth and yeah. homogenous. How, what led to this? Thank you for that question. I can tell you it wasn't an easy road. Um, on one hand, it was completely natural. I was truly following whatever was interesting to me. And as I said earlier, my, I was so thrilled to find my capacity for learning was enormous when it had to do with something that I genuinely cared about. So it didn't matter what subject it was in. So I realized I'm not going to get a PhD in astrobiology or astrophysics, but that doesn't mean that I can't relate to them. That being said, I was in a PhD program, a practice-based fine arts PhD program. And the most important lesson I learned, and please excuse me for saying this at a university, was that nobody knew how to do my work better than me. So as an artist, I gracefully bowed out and finished my book. And so that's one, and I do have to say, as an artist, there are, there's a lot more leeway than you have in the sciences. And I'm so grateful for that. And that's where I realized the only one who would stand in my way was me. So I just tried to get out of my own way. And that's what I've continued to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hi. So uh, with the photo on the seagrass meadows, um, yeah. you were talking about how that's a, a very old, um, maybe not organism, but uh, population. But within, within the seagrass meadows, you know, it's pretty ephemeral. So the leaves will shed quite regularly. Did you go into that dichotomy at all when you were doing your work, considering that? Yes, absolutely. So um, when I was speaking about the Tasmanian Lomatia, I was mentioning that that's a clonal organism. The same is true for the seagrass meadow. So it genetically is the same today as it was 100,000 years ago. So blades of grass will shed. So the same is true for the 80,000-year-old clonal colony of aspen trees in Utah. So in a sense, you could say it looks like a forest, but it's actually a single tree. And I don't believe I showed that image today. But these all work on the same principle, that genetically, they germinated in one form or another, and they're self-propagating, meaning they, there's no outside genetic information entering them in any way. And so the seagrass meadow, while no single blade of grass 
is remotely close to 100,000 years. The meadow itself is a single organism, so it's genetically the same today as it was when it first germinated. And so for me, I, again, so I got to create the criteria for my project. I could say I am including unitary organisms and clonal organisms. I got to decide. And to me, conceptually, that made sense because what I was trying to do was create a relationship between us as individual humans and the organisms themselves. So if this organism has been there for 100,000 years, I want us as humans to feel into what that means, what that thing has experienced in all of that time. And, and to be clear what the parameters were, so I'm not including just very primitive species. So it's not like, oh, here's ferns or here's liverwort. So it, it, to me, that wasn't doing the same thing. It wasn't genetic lines, it was individuals. Hello, um, I thought your presentation was, was wonderfully made and everything. A question that I have, well, after looking at all the photographs that you took of the landscapes and different organisms, of the 30 organisms that you took, I think it was really a great thing. But a question I have is that, can, we, can you like tell me like, like um, a con some connections that were made between the different organisms? Yes, they were very old. Um, as you said, they're like at least 2,000 years old. What other connections are there between like the or, um, organisms from all over the world? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. so yeah, that's a good question. I was I went into that a little bit when I was mentioning that a lot of these organisms live in very extreme environments, and so actually at the back of the book have a little chart comparison chart that I put together to look at some of the attributes of these things to see what is you know what are the secrets to their longevity. So again, living in very extreme conditions, so high altitude low nutrient availability, low water. Um, it also tends to correlate that the things growing the slowest tend to be the oldest, even amongst the oldest living things. That there's a, n a number of things that are 2,000 years old. And some of the biggest organisms, like the baobab tree that you saw at the beginning, those don't tend to live more than 2,000 years. And while it's, they're incredible to, to be around, they're growing pretty fast, comparatively speaking, much faster than those lichens for instance. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful presentation. And I remind you that the book is, uh, you will send the book outside, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, Rachel, it has been very uh, pleasure. Thank you. I would like to remind you that tonight at Times Square, we have uh, the cinema, the story of Earth, and we'll have an activity led by the student group and man Hello. Hi, how's it going? That's too loud. How are you guys? Say hi back. Uh, there's one of me, there's a billion of you. You guys are uncomfortable, I understand. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like uh, Mary Lou said, there's an event happening at uh, Times Square at 7. It's uh, something we made here at the, as part of the community, not as professional as you guys are used to here at WEP. Uh, but we would love for you guys to join us if you are interested in art and uh, time and artists, local artists, uh, then please show up at Discovery Square at 7 p.m. and uh, we'll get right to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.